Lifestyle Pirates with Big J and Adriano. Okay, good evening and welcome to this week's episode of Lifestyle Pirates with me, Big J, and him, Adriano. G'day. <laughs> very good, mate, very good. We're joined this week by Matthew Muburn from Everly Works. How are you? G'day, guys. Good, good. I'm well. Mate, Thanks re- for coming on, mate. Really good to have you here. And I appreciate you taking time out of your evening because, you know, weekends you're just where you're working. Yeah, we get smoked on the weekends, do a lot of blacksmithing classes, so it's uh, the easiest time to get people in. Was mm. that your first blacksmith pun? Oh, there'll be many more. Oh, Don't I you love worry. This. Oh, lovely. But, I love this. Well, because it's such an old trade, there's so many of those <laughs> sayings that refer back to. It's been around so long. You have to have a lot of vernacular. So yeah. you just you just keep your ear out. Oh, awesome. Can't wait. <laughs> awesome. Well, I will be. I'll probably write some down as we go along as well. So you are a blacksmith. Yes, full time blacksmith. That is your full time job. You've been doing it since you were 16. Yep, on and off. Now, when I was 16, I was kind of trying to play football. I was trying to play a lot of sports. Trying. Yeah, trying, <laughs> trying. Hence why I'm doing this now. <laughs> How did you fall into doing blacksmithing at 16? I mean, did you, was it knives? Were you listening to certain kind of rock music? What happened? Well, look, I was rubbish at football as well. Mm. So I, I needed to find an avenue. So you're saying I could have done it as well. <laughs> you absolutely, and it's never too late. <laughs> awesome. Um, oh, man, no. I'd love to see you doing a bit of blacksmithing job. <laughs> I, can't I even, would pay for your I course. can't even hang a picture. <laughs> I can light a candle. Maybe you should anyway. have a look at his toolbox later. It's, it's a right cack. And that's not a euphemism either. Mm-hmm. How did you get into it, buddy? Oh, look, the simplest way, I just love to make stuff. Honestly, it was uh, one of those things that – and, and I never really occurred to me that it was going to be a trade. It mm. was just – I grew up on a farm. I used to – you know, I'd help the old man welding and fixing and we were always hands deep in something greasy. So mm. it was pretty first nature for me to want to have my hands on stuff. Um, and then the more, you know, you get introduced to things through, uh, you know, through your parents and then through school a bit later doing industrial arts and all that stuff. And then, yeah, it, it Really, it just seemed like the most pure form of metalwork. I sort of, mm. I love running a lathe. I love milling machines, that sort of thing. We've got that kind of machinery as well in the workshop. But there's nothing simpler than just lighting a fire, putting a bit of iron in there, and hitting it with a hammer. So it was like just really reduced, distilled, mm. pure creation. That's what I love about it. Awesome. Yeah. So what? Where is blacksmithing from? What's the? Where's the term from? Oh from God! Main? So once upon a time, so. They, they had a whole – there's a whole plethora of trades that had the smith after that. So mm-hmm. the, the smith being the commonality where mm-hmm. they, they were forging, throwing a hammer. Um, you've got your copper smiths, you've got your silver smiths, you've mm-hmm. got – and blacksmith, the, the name of the blacksmith is literally from the fact that you're working in coal all day long, yeah. coal or coke or charcoal, and you're bloody dirty. Mm-hmm. It's, so it's, it's not a clean trade. Um, yeah, we're, we're probably the, the grubbiest of the trades, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> Another reason why I probably won't get into it. Oh, mate, can you imagine you with your pocket square? <laughs> All dirty. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Mopping my brow. Oh, that's another one gone. <laughs> so when did it start? Uh, well, it got it got serious about 10 years ago when, mm. you know, as I said, I tinkered on and off with all sorts of things, but I did the regular trajectory, finished school, went to uni for a bit. I wasn't – I just wasn't very sure. Mm. Like I didn't really know what I was doing. I kind of went to uni because that's what everyone does. Mm. And I'm really grateful that I did because I, I took science. So a lot of the stuff that I was learning, material sciences and, mm. you know, mechanical properties and things were actually really transferable. Not that I knew that at the time, of course. Yeah. But, yeah, I just I went away. I did, did science and thought, well, at least I'm studying something I enjoy. Didn't know what the field of, of work was going to be after I got out the other end, but didn't put much thought into it. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, it just occurred to me later. It was, uh, you know, I was in my early 20s and I went, hmm. I don't really want to do something corporate. I don't really want to sit in an office. So I would love to be out there and, and make and stuff. And mm. so I, I lobbed up. So I lobbed up to a TAFE, yeah. Ultimo TAFE, just around the corner here. Oh, went to um, Ultimo TAFE. What'd you do? Uh, mechanic. Brilliant. So you'd know where the blacksmith shop is. It's right next yeah. door. Um, so, yeah, I spent two and a half years in there learning the trade. Yeah. Um, Lindsay Cole, the blacksmith teacher there, is just fantastic uh, fountain of knowledge. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Old railway guy. So... In Australia, most of the blacksmithing jobs were in heavy industry. So in the railway, um, you know, the water board had blacksmith shops. The port guys down here, you know, Piermont, they had a blacksmith shop down there. So it was all big industry and it was all just around that support structure of making big things keep going. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, went to Ultimo TAFE and went, Fuck, I think I really like this. Mm. I could keep up. And 
unfortunately, there wasn't a lot of places for employment, just like with the science degree. <laughs> yeah. So I was forced into just starting a business. I just went, well, if I love this enough and I want to do it, I just have to throw my feet in the water and just see if I float. Um, so that was the start of it. So how do you get a – how did you get your first customer? It's not like, you know, you become a blacksmith. Yeah. And- so you start who's making your, – Who's your audience? Are who's, people Googling blacksmith nowadays? Now they are, you know. There's a big resurgence. I think people are starting to really – they're connecting with that idea of having things in perpetuity and having things that are meaningful and having things that are handmade and mm. have a bit of finesse. You know, I think that consumerism starting to abate a little bit. Yeah. Um, so people are now. There's a, there's a lot of demand for stuff like this. But to answer the question, I just started making stuff. Mm. And then there are – Little known, but there's trade shows and things for this kind of stuff. So you would – the biggest one is probably the Sydney Knife Show that happens – usually happens every year. COVID's put a spanner in. but They've got one of those in Granville daily. <sighs> That's a joke. No. <laughs> oh, I wanted to register my brain before I commented on that. No. But, uh, <laughs> I'm going to have to edit that one out. <laughs> Sorry, Habib. <laughs> um, yeah, so yeah. That, that's it. That yeah. was, you know, I started making stuff and then trying to sell stuff I'd already made. So it wasn't commission-based. Mm. Now it's all commission-based. I don't have any time to do passion projects really. Mm. It's people just keep knocking on the door and we just keep building stuff. So what were the first things you made? Because I remember arts and crafts as a kid at school and, you know, first pottery class, it was like an ashtray, it was pencil case, all that kind of stuff. What were the what were the first things that you started to to make when you were fresh out of, out of uni, you got your degree? probably setting up the business, what what, what you're kind of smashing out? Look, I don't want to admit this on air, but I'm going to (laughs) because there's a huge rivalry between blacksmiths and knife makers. Oh. Right? So within the circles, um, knife making – knife making is a subset of blacksmithing, right? You've got your blacksmithing umbrella and then you've got all these different – so you've got tool makers that that can forge their own tools. You've got the knife makers that forge their own knives, cutlers that put – other people's knives together. They're all kind of under this umbrella of blacksmithing, but um, I started out making knives. And yeah. most, most of my blacksmithing friends will be sitting there going, you dickhead. <laughs> <laughs> but there it is on the record. <laughs> Brilliant. Brilliant. <laughs> you, and we won't be editing scooped. that out. So how important are the kind of the materials? I mean, let's, I mean, let's talk about knives. We won't talk about knives for a long time, but mm. you can get kitchen knives out there. They're made from all these different kinds of steels and different materials. Like, is it all pretty much one and the same? No, no. And most of these materials are purpose specific. Yep. So they've been engineered, they've been sort of nuanced scientifically to within an inch of their lives. So, you know, you might, the steel that I select to make a hammer with is not going to be the same steel I select to make a knife with. And it's not going to be the same steel that I build a house out of. Hmm. Um, they're all engineered for different mechanical properties. And even within, specifically about knife making you know you've got your stainless varieties you've got your high carbon steels which are a little bit more a little bit simpler um there's so many different we call them alloys but they're basically recipes Mm. for Mm. steel yeah um and they all do different jobs some are tougher some are have better edge retention some of them will have you know higher hardness there's there's so many factors that go into so again in the small subset of knife making you wouldn't really want to make a bushcraft or a hunting knife out of a high alloy kitchen knife steel because you're going to take it into the paddock and the first time you poke something and twist it the wrong way, it's going to, sh- it's going to snap on you. Mm. Um, but by virtue of the fact that it's so hard and so brittle, that's what gives it that great edge retention and makes it an amazing kitchen knife. Mm. And they're not designed as pry bars, you know. It, yeah. The Japanese are so famous for this. They have a knife for just about everything. You know, they've got eel knives and they've got fish knives, very specific jobs for every knife because they know that if you treat a sh- sashimi knife the way that you would treat a knife that you would be cutting the head off a fish, you're going to chip that bad boy every day of the week. Yeah. So very specific recipes for very different jobs. Wow. Mm. When it comes to – I've always wanted to know this, right? When they're making a knife or a sword or, say, a samurai sword, when they fold it and they smash it down again, why do they keep on folding it? Like, why does that make it stronger? Well, because historically the ore that they were using wasn't of a great quality. So, you know, Japan is a – volcanic archipelago i guess um they don't have the same mineral rich soils that we have over here for instance in australia it's a very old continent um so the the whole purpose of the folding and the smashing and the drawing out is they're working out impurities so that whole time they're they're kind of trying to remove crap out of the steel and refine it and refine it and make it more durable or hardenable or whatever the properties that they're looking for 
Bit like, um, bit like when you make fresh pasta. Totally right. It, <laughs> That's, yeah. a, that's a really interesting analogy, though, because you do have this grain structure, this, you know, um, we talk about the plasticity of steel a lot in the classes, but when you heat it up and you deform it, you're actually stretching these, these fibers or these grains within the steel, and that's what makes forging so relevant still. You know, you've, we talk about blacksmiths being an anachronism, but, like, aerospace still forges a lot of their high alloy, you know, t- titanium and nickel based components and they still forge a lot in you know internal combustion engines pistons the best pistons are forged pistons Mm. it's the intrinsic strength that you get for the same weight that makes that important um and that's what you're getting with these swords you know as you draw it out and stretch it just like with the pasta you get all those grains interlocking and stretching and, and refining and you get a lot of intrinsic strength the mechanical properties are improved by the forging process just just so i know is that a career first for you Comparing pasta and swords. It is. Yes. It is. Every time. Every time. <laughs> That's two scoops I can't in one. You got that, man. <laughs> <laughs> you just you just you just start to listen because you we were talking about food. Yeah, I know, right. So, when, what was the first thing you sold? Um, wowza! It would have been to someone I know because my friends were incredibly generous in yeah. the early days, <laughs> instrumental in giving you the confidence and also a little bit of cash flow. Yeah. Um, I know I was making a lot of, I really liked making those kind of household country items, you know, like your wall hanging hooks and your, like your, your boot racks and things like that. Just, just cute little homeware items that I could get away with. Yeah. Um, something that's not too heavy. That would have been some of the first stuff that I would have sold. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. And then you mentioned obviously the commission side of things where people come to you and say, right, Matt, do this. What was your first, I guess, commission bit of work? And and was that a moment for you where you went, I've made it? <laughs> yeah, I think it feels good. I mean, again, it was such a – it would have been one of those staggered things that kind of – commission would have been a loose way to describe some of the early orders. You know, it might have only been a couple of hundred dollars for something, but it, it wasn't something I'd made already. It was to a drawing, yeah. which presents its own set of challenges. You know, someone someone else has got a – a mind's eye for what they want. And this is one of the things that I love about what I do still is a big part of my job is to bring to life these creations and imaginations from another person's mind. So you're, you're kind of like the midwife of of their passion project. Mm. So when someone comes in and says they want a set of gates, they don't come to me if they're looking for something straight, vertical, fabricated, the sort of thing you just get in any welding shop. You know, they, it's something that they've, anguished over and they've spent a bunch of time nuancing and and it's a bit weird and probably other guys won't take it on because it's got just too much going on uh they're the jobs that we tend to get and every time they're different every time they're weird they're difficult oftentimes but that's what i love because Mm. you know I, i couldn't do the same shit every day and that's the reason that i didn't end up in an office i just it doesn't matter what i'm doing i just every day is so different in the blacksmith shop that i'm engaged by that yeah. That's awesome. What's been the weirdest request? Um, actually, some of my earlier commissions yeah. um, because I was. That's when your mates were going, come on, let's see if we can do it. Not my <laughs> mates, but they're mates now. But at the time I I scarcely knew these people. But um, I, used, I, I spent a good chunk of time in the early days because I, I started doing some leather work as well just because mm. I thought, oh, this is – it was something I really enjoyed and it was pretty complimentary I guess in a lot of ways. So when I was making these – these hooks, I'd usually embellish them with a bit of leather or a bit of mm. just sass them up a little bit. So I was going out to um, – there used to be a, a tannery out in Botany. It's um, it's moved again now, but it was called Birdsall. And I used to head out there and do some leatherworking classes as well. And I would meet these people that were really into fetish gear. Mm. And once they got a bit of a drift that I was a blacksmith, because I wouldn't just – I wasn't advertising it at the time, but – I'd be hanging around and they'd be like, oh, what do you do? What's going on? And I'd say, I'm a blacksmith. And then they'd go, you see their little eyes light up a little bit, <laughs> which is a scary feeling <laughs> when a fetishist's eyes light up a little yeah. bit. Um, you can make uh, you can make handcuffs. <laughs> like, yeah, I probably make handcuffs. <laughs> yeah, I'll give it a go. You can make shackles. They've got these things called spreader bars, which uh, they – they go between your legs and they prevent you from closing them. So yeah, you John's got to sit. I thought I'd bring it up because I suspected I was in comfortable territory. 
Yeah, they're some of the weirdest things I've made because, uh, it, again, like anything, there's just – it's the nth degree. You you start making these weird little things and then before I knew it, after about six months of hanging out with some of these guys at the in the leather circles, um, there used to be – they're not there anymore, but there used to be a fetish market once a month over in Annandale somewhere. And then I thought, oh, well, you know, this is, I'm onto a good thing here. So I started going to these markets with like – whips and bloody all sorts of shit with like nice forged handles yeah. you know i added these these really human elements um and it was fun because just the breadth of people you'd meet yeah. there was it was just great conversation um you know a lot of them are and, and this shouldn't come as a surprise or something that i i should be surprised by but they're just really regular people that just have a weird way of exploring sexuality that's yeah. you know there's nothing wrong with that no i've got to ask in in the workshop when you were making the spreaders did you get one of the boys to like, excuse me, mate, let me just tack this here or something? Mate, there's no way to to know that you're the right length unless you test them, is there, right? I knew it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> that would have been a great shout when, oh, yeah, no. when, when, when the boss walks in. Hello, mate, what are you doing? Oh, just, mate, just yeah, working on his spreaders. Uh, make them sure my knees are far apart. Yeah. <laughs> what does it look like I'm doing? I don't know. Brilliant. Absolutely brilliant. And what's your – do you stamp your work? So you know how, like, graffiti artists have a tag? Yeah. Does everything that you put out have, you know, like a – Branding. A, a bit of a brand? It or, does. Yeah. yeah, we call it a touch mark. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, we do. So I've got this – it's, you know, 10 or 15 mils around and yeah. you just uh, – a lot like a letter stamp. You know, the, yes. you know mm. the ones – yeah, a lot like that, but it's my logo. So I just punch that into jobs when I'm finished. Yeah. I've got one for myself and I've got one for the shop that I work in. So – yeah. If I'm doing a big run of tools that were on order, they'll generally get stamped with the shop's initials. And then when I make something a bit special, if it's just been me working on it, I'll put my touch stamp on it as well. Yeah. So the workshop you're in now, um, you've mentioned that it's a, an industrial cathedral. I have. Right. How did the, how did the, the acquirement of that facility come about? Because it looks like it's surely like heritage listed and all that, and you just got a workshop in there. It is, yeah. And also, so, the workshop was already done as well. Oh, absolutely. So that that workshop's been there. It has been a, a continuous mm. blacksmiths workshop since eighteen eighty seven. So mm. the the railways built. So we're talking about Everly. Mm. Um, the business I, I run is Everly Works. We operate out of Everly. So the Everly precinct used to be this monstrous, sprawling, vertically integrated train repair and building facility right in the heart of Sydney, right mm. just next to Redfern. So awesome. they used to – so they, they built this facility in the late – well, late 19th century. It, was, it opened in 1887 mm. um, and the nucleus of the building or the nucleus of the whole site is actually the building I'm in now. So it's called the Locomotive Workshop. Um, and so the blacksmith shop up, occupies the first two bays of that and then they had everything else that you'd need to get – the, the bare components of a train. So, you know, they had a machine shop, they had a boiler making shop, they had a heat treatment facility there for springs and, and that sort of thing. And coach work as well there? Yeah, so Carriage Works is the the famous brother of the locomotive workshop. It's a very similar facility. The mm. building is almost identical. It's actually smaller. The loco is bigger. Mm. Um, but Carriage Works is, as the crow flies, it's only a couple of hundred metres, but you know where it is on mm. Wilson Street. Yeah. It's the opposite side of Redfern. Um, but that was all part of the same precinct. So it had started in the blacksmith shop. We had an on-site foundry, which has been knocked down now, but they used to be casting. I know, mate. There's a, there's a lot of the history there has mm. been eroded over the years and it's just the way of the world, I guess. But yeah. um, we're very lucky to be left with what we are left with and it, you could always wish for more, but, mm. but it could be a lot less if it weren't for kind of instrumental times in the last 20 or 30 years where people stood up and went, no. You're not going to erode this. You're not mm. going to take this history out from under us. Um, but they would build locos from start to finish. So they would take raw materials. They would cast their own big ingots or these big lumps of steel that might weigh four or five tons. Cool. They'd drag them over to the blacksmith shop and they'd squeeze them under a, a press there. We've got this famous piece of machinery called the Davy Press. The Davy Press, yeah. Yep. I saw a video on that. Beautiful thing. Like – Victorian era machinery and it's, you know, those old machines, they've got elegance, you know, they're, they're not these crappy looking square fabricated things like they were, they've got curve and they've got design and you can see that the people that made them, they were engineers, but they're also artists and they, they really strive to not just have something functional, but also have something that was a, a bit beautiful. Hmm. Um, it's so, huge, that machine. It's a monster. So it's yeah. a 1500 ton press, one and a half thousand tons of compressive force. So it's, it's no small thing. Over what sort of uh, surface area? 
So the dies are about the size of this table. For those that are visually impaired, it's around about probably a meter wide um, and maybe six or 700 millimeters or 0.6, 0.7 of a meter across. Mm. Um, and so you can lay down some very serious pieces of steel. You know, the steel that you put on there might be two feet across as a square cross section. Um, and there's cranes, there's all that support infrastructure there to actually be able to manipulate these things. But back in the old days, you know, when, when it was a railway facility, it was just manpower. Mm. Like it was, the cranes were there to support the bulk of it, but the actual, the manipulating and the turning and moving of the job and the positioning to get it right, it was all just done with leverage. Mm. Um, really incredible. If you find, there's a couple of really great YouTube videos out there of Everly working, the Everly Blacksmith Shop particularly working. Mm. Um, it's a serious bit of kit. So how much of the original equipment is still sort of functional? Almost all of it. Um, so the Davy Press isn't. The the part that makes that shop, I guess, the, the thing that it was famous as is it's a steam-powered shop. Um, so a lot of the machinery that used to be in there was run on steam. Even the stuff now that's been converted, a lot of things like the guillotine and the drill presses and things, the lathes, they would have originally been run on a stationary steam engine with a, a line shaft. Yeah. And you've seen those probably in photos, but there's just big, big boilers, foot wide leather belts. Oh. Yeah, big, big boilers out the front. So they're still there, but they're not operational. Um, but they would drive these long, long axles essentially with big wheels on them that would drive these leather belts. Um, famously dangerous because the leather belts are humming along it. And you'd have these oh. apprentices, 15, 16 years old, that'd be kind of running between these leather belts and something goes wrong, it rips an arm off kind of vibe. But Ooh. oh, yeah casual hell of a place to work yeah. like it, we romanticize blacksmithing and i i romanticize it a lot because i love it but i think in a historical point of view it would have been a real shit of a place to work it would have been a very difficult very dirty sort of dangerous life limiting place to work yeah. totally right um staff turnover yeah well if you were good you know it's i think once you got to 20 if you're still alive you probably made it to the end but yeah there was a high attrition rate in the early days probably everything been running off steam like surely there'll be leaks and stuff everywhere it'll be a noisy place as well oh yeah oh yeah um i i think that so steam's one of those funny beasts you know it's whoop it's very because it's hot as well how's that yeah i got some resonance there <laughs> yeah i liked it um yeah, because it's hot, you get the ex you get expansion in the joints and that mm. sort of tightens everything up. So every time you let the system cool down, when you first power it up, it'll sort of leak a bit like a sieve and there'll be water dripping everywhere. And as you probably imagine, water with the hot steel around it can be a bit of a combo. Mm. Um, so, yeah, it, every morning would have been – there would have been steam everywhere. The whole shop would have been just full of it. Yeah. And then over the course of the day, it probably just dry itself out and it all sort itself out. But a lot of the back to what you were saying before, though, a lot of the machines were steam powered in in whatever way that they were steam powered. Mm. Nowadays, because we don't have the steam, a lot of it's been converted to electric motors, and there's only really three or four pieces of gear in there now that aren't running. Yeah. So we've, you know, we we use a lot of the old blacksmithing machinery. Those power hammers are the mm. famous one, yeah. big, big kinetic hammers. If you haven't, if you don't know what I'm talking about, just look that up on YouTube. Power hammer, mm. great bit of kit. Um, and, you know, things like guillotines, drill presses, lathes, milling machines, we've all got those now, but they're all electrically driven. Yeah. So yeah. a blacksmith wouldn't traditionally use a lathe, would they? No. Yeah. Famously, they would, have been, they would have been kicked for it because yeah. places like the railways were so heavily unionised that you stayed in your lane. You know, if you weren't an electrician, you didn't touch electricity. If you weren't a welder, you wouldn't touch a welding machine. Um, even if you knew how to use it, you would in no way – allowed to touch anyone yeah. else's job because it was just like this is a union thing we don't lay off people we you know we we need to protect jobs that was their way of doing it so, so no. how did you take on everly so uh about five years ago or so i was working in a shop down in alexandria um mm. i was sharing with a good mate of mine geordie and zaya a couple of good mates of mine and um we it was just out of the blue. I was demonstrating at a blacksmithing festival down mm -hmm. down south somewhere and the fellow that was running it at the time, um, he was down there as well and I, I was giving a demo and he sort of saw me do that and went, oh, you know, maybe he was looking to teach some classes and he was looking for teachers. So, yeah, he approached me afterwards and said, hey, look, do you want to come and work for me? And I went, oh, I don't think so, no, because I was just getting a bit excited about what I was building as a business and where I was headed and, I, I knew the place and I, I knew what Everly was, but, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to keep my own ball, you know. And 
So I said no reluctantly and he went, well, bugger that. How about you just, you know, how about you just come in? We'll have a bit of a play. We'll have a chat. Maybe you can teach some classes on the weekend. And I went, yeah, that's that suits me way better. I'll kind of contract for you. And so that was where it started. And then we just grew this friendship, you know. we Because we were so close to each other, we'd both do a day's work in our respective shops, he mm. in Redfern, me in Alexandria. And then about 4 o'clock, most days I could expect a call and he'd be like, the boys have gone home, I've got the furnace on, get your ass over here. And it was just this really nice time of pure pure dicking around, you know. Mm. I'd show up and we'd he'd have a lump of steel in there and we'd just – we would. I remember at the time he was trying to make a Damascus uh, – a plane so you know a, a, I, don't, I don't think block plane is what we we're aiming for but i'm not a I'm not a real big woodworking guy so someone's going to curse me for this but <laughs> we're trying to the damascus steel is that beautiful layered mm. pattern steel you see mm. in the japanese um knives and things nowadays but we were just we were just trying to take that pattern and then put it onto these beautiful woodworking tools and yeah so that was where it started we just we forged up a friendship another pun yeah, nice. Number so, two. Yeah, that was good. Um, <laughs> hey, do you want to come in here full time? <laughs> <laughs> we, we came and sort of just, just started that friendship and then it, it wasn't that much longer and he was kind of over it. He'd been in there for 20 years. So, you know, um, Gita and Wendy are the people I'm referring to. They had a business world artworks that they operated out of there for 20, 20 something years. Um, and they were pretty instrumental in saving the shop in the early days as well. So, um, you know, I'll always, always have full respect for the amount of effort and energy that they put in particularly now that I've gone through a similar thing with, and we'll talk about this a bit later, but Mervac have recently or a few years ago recently acquired the site from state government right. and, the, and there was a whole bunch of new pressures about development that we had to process. But, yeah, they had those in the early days when they were, when the government still owned it, there was a big call for from within the government to knock it over, just in the whole thing. So we had, you know, there's a lot of big influential people through Sydney like, um, you know, Jack Mundy, I think he's, He's pretty famous for for fighting for water rights and fighting for like community advocacy. Mm. Um, Brian Dunnett, who was another famous sort of red man around town mm. that would just come and come and push these bullies back out. Um, so yeah, they they were part of that fight, and you know, in a lot of ways, without guys like that, we wouldn't have that space mm. now as a, as a as a community. Um, yeah. So anyway, that was that was my association with the shop early on, and mm. then he just after twenty odd years, I think they just went, you know what. I got to get out. Yeah. You know, Sydney's Sydney's beat them. It's a, I think, you know, I touched on the the sale of the place. I think they probably realised at that time too that maybe they just didn't have the energy to do that all over again. Yeah, yeah. Because knowing what I know now and being where I am now, I reckon it was it was a lot of it was a big bite and there was a lot of chewing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, he just tapped me on the shoulder and went, "Maddie, I'm I'm a bit over it. You know, are you do you think you're in a position to want to take this place over? Yeah." And um, I said no because the outgoings alone were more than I was making at any at any given time. I was a one-man band, you know. Yeah. Um, so I went no and then I went home and thought about it and I just realised that it didn't matter if I went broke. Mm. I'd never get an opportunity to run a shop like that ever again. Mm. Um, there's, only, there's only one in Sydney certainly but a shop like that, there's very few of them left in the world. Um, so I sort of thought about it and I went, well, I'm not really worth anything. I don't have a lot to lose. Um, so have, have a swing. Have a swing and see what happens. So, and that was five or six years ago. Um, Brilliant. Yeah. That is such a fabulous mindset. Mm. That is so, I mean, that is literally, yeah. I've got nothing to lose, but I love it. And I'm yeah. going gonna to do it anyway. That's mega. <clears throat> no, it was, uh, it, and it was huge. Like I remember there was, when it was happening, like there was, it, the emotional roller coaster of just trying to move in and trying to secure a lease and trying to figure out how to make the thing financially viable you know like i'm i'm like most stoic australian men you don't talk about feelings but forgot like i would have cried half a dozen times in the first two weeks i was there because i just i realized the enormity of the job in front of me mm. and i just didn't know if it was going to come off you know it was probably the first time in my life where i'd ever done something that i wasn't sure i was going to be able to do mm -hmm. you know it's the the hubris you have when you're in your early 20s you just of course you're good at shit of course you're good at everything mm. um and it was the first time i'd looked down the barrel of something that i thought this could be a challenge that i'm not going to overcome it's humbling fucking hell <laughs> yeah big time it is so day one how did you choose your team or did your team roll over or no no so we um so Next part of that story was um, 
so he'd he'd come to me and said, "Look, we're we're moving out. Do you want to move in?" And and I said no, and then I said yes, and then he came back and said, "Well, look, my my daughter is actually she she's not a blacksmith. She's not involved in she wasn't involved in metalwork and probably not terribly interested in it. I guess past the pedestrian interest that you have in your parents, mm-hmm. um, but sh- her she was really talented." as a designer she did a lot of our graphics and mm. and our branding and all of that stuff and that was instrumental like and i you know we are we founded that thing her her my, her catalina uh, and her partner louis and myself were the three people that co-founded everly works mm-hmm. um and you know there's they're still friends of mine and we still i, I have the most immense respect for both of them because without them there's absolutely no way that well you you just never know where you'd be mm. otherwise but you know, I think about doing what we did and trying to do it without them and I it, I just don't think it would have happened. Yeah. And he saw that early. So Guido, the fellow that was the former owner of it, he probably saw that and he realised that we were three people that had very different skill sets. Um, I bought the the metalworking and the blacksmithing um, and then between the three of us, Kat building up a brand and, you know, Louis bringing in some business and we all just – we just made it work, you know. Um so that was it was scary and it was intense and it was fun and it was exciting and you know the the place has changed so much since I've been there that I I even you forget you know mm. like after 5 years it's just such a constantly evolving beast that it's only when I sit down and have a yarn with with people like we are now that I even cast my mind back and go holy shit yeah that was a thing <laughs> yeah. you, just, it's, you just don't ponder on it I yeah. guess normally yeah and so when did the classes I guess become official because, I mean, I was on the website and looking at it and, and I guess for those that are tuning in, so <clears throat> we were connected by by Matt, by a friend that actually has been on the show that has done the class and absolutely loved it. Mm. So when did the idea of, in, for the classes and – because you can make axes, you can make knives, you, you know, there's so much stuff you can do or what yeah. you want to do. Well, how did that come about? So it was pretty early on. So when we – So you're still building stuff and be, and commissioning stuff and this was just another – yeah, it's another layer. Yeah, because it was a way for us to kind of force multiply. Because we there's not a lot of blacksmiths out there, and there was we, you know, I was a bit trepidatious about how how to scale the business. Yeah, you know how not to go too big too soon. How not to there was just all these things in my head, and I I I kind of realized that if we were running blacksmithing classes, it wouldn't be just me one on one. That we could have a larger group, which which increase the income because the space is massive you know it's we're talking about 1500 square meters in the middle of redfern so it's it's a monster of a space a lot of real estate a lot of real estate a lot of room to move around in so we'll do a follow-up show on on site you should absolutely come for a visit (laughs) yeah it's um it's a really special place and we'll do it in the evening because it's so beautiful at night you know this the place has such presence and you know there's because it's so dense with all the tools and the Everything that's in there has kind of been made in that room by yeah. the guys that worked in that room. So you've got this c- continual connection, this lineage of, um, you know, blacksmithing heritage. You really feel the presence of the guys that have worked there. Yeah. Um, and so when you're at there in the evening, there's just, you know, there's steel everywhere and there's everything's made out of steel and it's just a very dense environment and the, the shadows play tricks and it's a, a, a very cool place to have it, a beer. Is it quite warm as well? Because everything's kind of cooling down Only throughout the, the day. Would be <laughs> <laughs> it's funny. People tell me that all like, oh, imagine being a blacksmith in the middle of summer. The shittest time to be a blacksmith is in the middle of winter because you stand in front of a furnace and you sweat your ass off. It doesn't matter if it's 10 degrees or 50 degrees ambient temperature. When you're in front of a furnace, it's always hot. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. When you're in front of a big lump of steel, it's always hot. So yeah. you sweat and then as soon as you break, you go for smoko, Whoa. you step away from the furnace, you're wet, dripping, and you get the chill really yeah. fast. So it's winter's the terrible time to forge, not summer. Yeah. Um yeah. But it, yeah, it's pretty like it's high ceilings. It's a monster of a place and it's got louvered roofs. So you the heat escapes pretty well. It's and the smoke as well. You know, it's not as smoky as you'd think. It's not as overbearing as you'd expect for an industrial place. And and what's it like walking into your office? I can imagine it's a bit. I don't know, a bit like going to time, like a time time warp or something. Yeah, you just it is. Yeah, um, yeah. And there's that's a, there's that's, no swipe in card. There's no code. There's no alarm to turn off. <laughs> it's a. Yeah, I've got myself a, a an old school padlock. Well, that's funny. When you come to visit, I'll show you what I mean. But we've just had the the front fence that used to just be a really generic front fence has just been replaced by this. They call it the blacksmith's ribbon, but it's basically our boundary. But it also doubles as display cabinets that they hold a 
it's almost a chronological exhibition of blacksmithing. So you start off in the first end corner with mm. coal and or coke. You know, there's some raw material. I think they might have. Um, I don't know if it's um, uh, hematite. I, I don't know what the ore is, but an iron ore. Um, and then there's there's tooling that would have been an early stage of a process. And then there's some molds there out of the pattern shop that were from casting. Mm. And you know, it tells this story of of the development of how blacksmithing would have worked on site. Mm. Um, so that's my fence now, and it's this brand new shiny bloody display case that's. Um, <laughs> It's all very high tech. It's all very beautiful. Uh, tastefully done, but yeah, it's mm, yeah. it's all new. Um, but yeah, it's the the machinery and stuff. In in that's what makes the shop so special. Is it's still in context. You know, we all of the cranes that were used in in those days to support the heavy jobs are still there. All of the you know those kind of um, the intermediary machines that you need to prepare jobs and to cut up jobs and everything that sort of supports the big forging roles is still there in the context that it would have been. Um, and as I mentioned before, the, the hand tools and all that is still there. So that's that really important connection to the past. It hasn't been just gutted. And mm. there's nothing sadder than, and I, I don't want to bring down carriage works at all when I say this, but you, this is something people would probably probably have noticed. But you know where the carriage works market mm. is. There's a couple mm. of big machines that are standing there. As, mm. And they're kind of like, islands they're like these you know big monoliths that sort of sit there but there's nothing that tells any kind of story about what that machine was used for yeah they're just sitting there as a big lump of iron there's there's absolutely nothing there's a little plaque there that really doesn't tell you that much um whereas the other side of the shop in the loco workshop it's it's not like that it's everything that made sense around that machine is still around that machine so it tells that story mm. yeah. and and on the story side of things so you spoke uh, earlier about this yeah, the, the kind of artisan vibe. There's still a lot of curiosity about what a blacksmith is, what they do. <clears throat> I was reading an article about the Netflix economy. Mm. So when the um, the Queen of Gambits came on Netflix, you know, sa- the sale of chess boards <laughs> yeah. went through the roof, and you know, chess clubs and all that stuff just went. Like, it was like nearly like an all time high. Do you see? You know, I guess when Game of Thrones comes on, when those kind of films come on, and you see this these this beautiful craft work, but they're obviously props. Do you see a bit of a surge in interest? Like, can you pair it back and go, hey, we've, we've had a cracking quarter. And that was because the Game of Thrones finale was on. Like, do, does that stuff kind of influence? It does. I think it's slower. I, th- I don't know that. So we wouldn't have such a linear correlation, but there's a few shows going around now. The big one is probably Forged in Fire, if you've ever heard of it. Mm. It's um, an American series that is centered around making – edged weapons, you know, mostly knives and swords. Yeah. Um, that is pretty huge. And also YouTube. YouTube drive a lot. There's, there's so many – and it's one of the things that I love now about – like I'm a huge YouTube fan mm-hmm. um, because I've got contact – I've got a pair of eyes on the people that are doing really cool things in their shed that you'd never otherwise know existed there. Mm. And they just – so, you know, I, I watch a lot of machining channels and I watch a bunch of, bunch of blacksmithing channels, which you wouldn't, you know, because I'm doing it, but – I just love watching other people work and seeing yeah. how their techniques vary from mine and um, and people are doing the same. So, you know, they're jumping on YouTube, they're seeing these big guys doing these you know, very, I, I don't know about different, but, you know, just out of the ordinary trades and that's what makes them want to have a go. Mm. And it might sit in someone's head for ages. You know, we have people that they'll contact us and be like, oh, yeah, we've thought about it for two or three years and it's sort of just – Follied around in our brain for a bit, and you know they finally pulled the trigger. I've had because we've we've been lucky to shoot a few things for places like uh, we did a Sydney Weekender and we did a a Better Homes and Gardens segment, and um, that was like eighteen months ago. We did the Better Homes and Gardens, and I will still about once or twice a month. I'll get someone to send me an email or ring me up and be like, "Hey, I want to book a class. I saw you on telly. I think they do reruns or something. They must, <laughs> or they must like stream it on iView or something, but." Yeah. Yeah, I still get people will will call back to things I've done on TV or whatever in the past. It's uh, it's awesome. Real weird. You never know how it'll come. How much has technology changed blacksmithing? Not a lot. Um, since the Industrial Revolution, not a lot. Yeah. Before that, it was a massively different trade. Mm-hmm. Um, it was very manual and it was – so when you, when you talk about blacksmithing in Europe, um, a lot of the big shops over there, they had to have these Goldilocks of, of – location so they needed to be conveniently near 
fuel sources. So in that, a lot of that was charcoal. Um, so they needed to be near forests. And really interestingly, I learned this over in Norway, around steel making towns in Norway, and we're talking three, four, 500 years ago, there was an obligation that if you were in a steel making district and you owned land, you were obliged to supply a certain amount of charcoal per year to run the blast furnaces. So everybody kind of had their, they would sort of desiccated or al- desiccated, <laughs> allocated. <laughs> designated. Up, that's not even, a, it's not a blacksmithing <laughs> word. No. Do you want um, another Bundy? <laughs> <laughs> Mate, I'm addicted to these things. Um, yeah, they, they were given an allocation and that was what they were obliged to perform, you know, make this charcoal and give it to the blast furnace just by being a landowner. Um, tax. Yeah, well, they were paid for it, but it wasn't, they weren't paid well for it. They were kind of only just really reimbursed mm. for the effort, if you know what I mean. Um, but there was no way to own land without fulfilling this obligation. Mm. That's how important the industry was to the community. So, yeah, you needed your shops to be near these sort of supplies. You also needed them to be on water because the water drives the water wheels, which would drive the bellows like a big supercharger. Mm. You know, we've got uh, in the workshop, we've got these things called roots blowers, which are famously, you've heard of root superchargers, yeah. Any, anyone that's a car guy, they're, they're exactly what you think it is, except it's five feet tall and the, each of the, the veins in it is like three feet across. Mm. You know, they're monsters. Um, but that hasn't changed. You know, back in those early days, they just had these big wooden structures with big wooden veins with leather seals on them that would turn by water wheel and that would push the air in the bottom of the blast furnaces and that's how they created the heat for these steel making processes hundreds of years ago. Um, and the power hammers, you know, we use before steam and before electricity, the power hammers used to be these really simple cam driven, they call them beam hammers or, um, or water hammers, but that's a bit boring. But they're basically just a, a cam that sits on the end of a water wheel. And so as the cam turns around to the lobe, it would lift the hammer up and then it drops, drops it when it drops off the cam. And it just rotates. And so once you turn it on, it's got a pretty constant BPM and you do your work and then you chock it up when the cam hits the top dead center, change jobs, do whatever you're going to do. And yeah, really, really rudimentary tech. Mm. And then was the industrial revolution. So someone realized, I think it was Watts, um, Bolton, Watts, one of those guys realized that they could harness this expansion of water. Mm. So they'd heat it up. We, We kind of had the advent of the steam and I think it was pumps. The first thing they used steam for was just pumping water out of the bottom of mine shafts. Mm. Um, and it was a little while after that discovery that someone went, you know what, we can just we can take this reciprocating motion and we Do we anything. can turn it into anything. Yeah. yeah, it was like this this reciprocating motion suddenly became the power source for an entire revolution, and that was the industrial revolution. Um, so yeah, they they realized fairly soon after that you could attach them to locomotives and the pistons would go horizontally and that would drive the wheels and that was cool. And then someone went, well, shit, we can turn them vertically and we can run a piston up and down and we can mount that to a frame and all of a sudden you've got a power hammer. Um, and that was really as simple as it is. And the, the there's machines that I'll show you when you get to the workshop, but that's exactly how they run. There's a simple valve system. They push steam in the bottom and that lifts the weight, mm. lifts the hammer pump steam in the top and it pushes it down. And it's really, really rudimentary. It's just a lever. You pull the lever up, it goes up, you push it down, it goes down. And with that, they were able to break down these monstrous pieces of material and places like France and Germany, you know, they were really at the forefront of this this forging technology. And some of the photos of some of the sizes of the hammers that they were building, you know, there's there's one I've got on my wallpaper on my uh, desktop where there's a fellow standing on top of what is the anvil. That's the the impact surface of these hammers. Um, and the anvil itself is as big as a truck. You know, it's, oh, wow. We're talking about tens of tons of material under there just to support that falling mass. And, and because any of that, any of that falling weight that's not sent into the job gets absorbed into the ground. And yeah. so you need a big mass there to resist that force. Very, very cool. What about the noise or the vibration oh, that that would cause? Absolutely immense. <laughs> oh, that would be so sick. So, so walk me through the process then. So when we rock up to one of your classes, uh, how, what happens? Well, it depends what the class is. But I mean, well, no, but like, I guess I'm trying to understand the process yeah. also of like melting it all down to then shape it and things, but I'm, I'm trying to breathe in the experience. Yeah, that's so. A, that's a foundry, isn't it? When you, yep. You, you still got a foundry or no, you don't have we a foundry? D- we don't. So we, we as, a, as blacksmiths, the, the key time for us to work, if I get liquid metal, I've made a mistake. 
as soon as stuff starts to melt, I'm in the trouble. Mm. So we're trying to get it to this elevated temperature where it becomes plastic and it will deform and we can manipulate it and not introduce too much stress to it. So you've heard of work hardening. Like you take a bit of fencing wire and you bend it back and forth, three or four bends in and you've snapped it mm. because uh, you're – you're basically concentrating stress in the area that you're flexing yeah. and then all of a sudden the stress gets so great you break it. That doesn't happen with hot material because you when you elevate that temperature, it increases the, the malleability, the ductility and the plasticity of the steel and you're not going to get that stress building up and introducing all of this stress that, that causes to those brittle, brittle failures. Um, so that's what we do. We chuck it in a fire. We bring up the temperature, depending on the alloy, it, it's really specific to the recipe, but you would generally be forging around about 1,100 or 1,000 to 1,100 degrees Celsius is pretty common forging temperature. Uh, and when it's at this temperature, it will take all of that force and it will, it will allow you to deform it without introducing all these stresses that you couldn't do cold. Mm. Um, so, yeah, I try not to burn my steel or melt my steel. When you come in for a class, uh, we do a walk around the shop. So we spend the first 15, 20 minutes just getting people comfortable, showing them around, doing a bit of a safety brief, having on about what we're going to do. Um, you know, we could have – our classes are fairly small, but we've often got people that, you know, they don't know the rest of the group. So it's just nice to get people to gel for a little bit in the first 15, 20 minutes. Um, and then depending on our job, we most of our processes will start with hot metal work. Um, so – there's, there's a lot of things, like a knife is a great example. There's a lot of stuff that isn't forging and knife making. You know, once you've rough shaped it, it's not just perfectly finished with a handle on it. You know, there's all of that grinding and cleaning off. The, mm. We call it scale, but it's the, you know, the rough surface that you get on, on the uh, – it's an accelerated rust. It's an iron oxide. Mm. It happens at high temperatures, so you've got to clean all that off. If you want a nice clean blade that cuts well and doesn't doesn't rust and, and you know, the you need to polish it up. So – we use linishes, which are basically a belt sander for that. You got to put the handles on, which is you know, shaping and drilling holes, all that sort of stuff. But yeah, depending on the class, we just dive straight into it, and it's one of those really funny things. We, we don't have a lot of, you know, I don't see it as a particularly dangerous place. Mm. You know, a blacksmith shop is not the sort of place that I would, I would want people coming in, and you you want to come in with a reverence for it, but shouldn't come in with a feeling of, of anxiety or a feeling of kind of danger impending because hot stuff is – it's never the hot stuff that burns you. Like when you've got a hot piece of steel, it's, it's pretty expected. intuitive not to touch it, right? Yeah. The stuff that burns you is a pair of tongs. That's the famous one. You know, you're holding the hot job with the tongs. You put the hot job down and then you put the tongs on your anvil or wherever you put them. They're not glowing. The job's glowing so you know it's hot. But the tongs aren't glowing, but they're still a couple of hundred degrees. <laughs> that's where you get burnt. Um, would, would you say that's the main kind of occupational kind of hazard? Yeah, well, <laughs> it probably is. I mean, <laughs> uh, there's plenty of ways to go awry in a blacksmith shop, but I think as as long as you're respectful of the machinery and, and the forces involved, um, we've touch on wood, you know, we've never had any, any serious blacksmithing injuries. And we don't have in, – in the classes, the most common – things that we have are just people getting little cuts and nicks from using hand tools. It's oh. it's very rarely the machinery that bites people. It's just the simple day-to-day -day stuff, the pedestrian stuff that you're not focusing on. Have you cooked any bread in the furnace? Mate, I've pizza? cooked, you name it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so no, not bread actually. I'm, I'm not a much of a bread cook, but I've cooked meat. Um, I've cooked, oh, yes. we've had Kranskis. There's yes. a shout out to Sausage Man. Uh, there's a friend of ours we call the Sausage Man. Because he, every blacksmithing meet up, he brings a skillet and he makes Kranskis. Yeah. He just cuts up Kranskis. Is he outside? Crack. Did he drop what you off tonight? I wish he had it. What a legend. Look, if you're out there, mate, come and get me because I need a Kranski. Yeah. <laughs> oh, man. Of course, I would have done the same thing. It's like, Absolutely. Man, it's You've got amazing heat. heat source. <laughs> That's right. And a lot of the events, you camp on site. You know, you, we, we travel around and when we do places like the Lost Trades Fair, you know, the, you're, you're often camping out. Mm. Iron Fest, you ever heard of Iron Fest up no. in Lithgow? Really fun, really fun. It's pretty out there. Mm. You know, it's turned into a bit of a, there's a bit of a roll. cosplay, mm. no, a bit of a cosplay element. So they, you know, these, you get a lot of people dressed up in some pretty weird stuff, which I, I'm into. I think it's yeah. fun, you yeah. know. Um, but yeah, we, we go up to these places in Lithgow and we camp on site and we, 
we have a fire and we talk shit and drink beers and it's just a, a really nice yeah, kind of awesome camaraderie, really good. So once you've forged it or you've not forged it, you've hammered it down, uh, there's a few things I want to know. One, why do they put it in cold water or just water? You don't. You don't? You don't. Okay. You see that in the movies. Yeah. Don't do it. Yeah, because wouldn't it shatter or – It does. Yeah. <laughs> don't do it. Okay, good. <laughs> be like Terminator 2. Could be. Liquid metal, man. Yeah. Again with the liquid metal over here. <laughs> um, all right, so hardening and tempering. Yep. So they're two different processes but never to be separated from each other. Mm-hmm. So you're, you're hardening – we talked a little bit about me- the mechanical properties of steel before but when you – just like you described, you heat something up above its transformation temperature. So what that means is when you when you're working steel and you're forging it, you're actually working it at this elevated temperature and when it gets, depends on the recipe, but when it gets above round about that 800 degree mark in a lot of cases, again, temperature moves, but mm. it will change phases. So the way that the, the atoms in that steel line up is a repeating pattern. That's what makes a solid a solid um, with the exception of amorphous solids like glass, but we won't go too far. Yeah, I was going to um, say that. But you, <laughs> So in most solids, you've got this repeating pattern whatever it is, it could be cubic, it could be hexagonal, but you'll have these layers and these lines of long stretching repeating patterns. When you get it above this transformation temperature, it changes. Mm -hmm. So your repeating pattern might go, it doesn't matter where it would go to and from, but it it would change the repeating pattern. And often things like a density shift will happen. So, you know, in steel, the, the great one for us is when it gets above the transformation temperature, it goes into this this Martin side, but it changes density and it becomes less dense. Mm. So it takes up more volume. And that's why with samurai swords, when they quench a katana, you notice that they get that big, long curve in them. Mm. They're not curved out of the forge, or they may be slightly curved out of the forge, but what's actually happening is you've got clay on the back, which insulates the steel and stops it from cooling quickly. Mm. And then you've got the exposed cutting edge, the blade on the other side that's not insulated. Because the martensite, this, this hardened state of the steel is less, uh, less dense, it takes up more space. So when it's quenched, it forces it to peel back because the cutting edge is actually – it lengthens mm. and the, the spine doesn't. So anyway, that was a roundabout way of saying we need to get it up to an elevated temperature, let everything go into solution. All of those alloying elements will mix around and do what they're going to do and then we, we cool it very quickly. And when we do that, we trap all of these alloys in places that they normally wouldn't want to be located. That creates stress and stress is hardness. Hardness is just a symptom of having stress in your blade. So, and you can achieve hardness in other ways. Like you can work harden things, which doesn't require temperature, but we were talking about flexing wire back and forth. The reason that it breaks, it's a brittle failure, but it breaks because you've hardened the material. You've caused these stresses to, to, be focused in a particular area. Um, so stress and hardness are the same thing. So when you take it up to this elevated temperature and cool it quickly, you create a lot of stress in the blade, but you create hardness, which is great for a working tool. Then you need to take some of that hardness out because that's how you you cut down on your brittleness. Mm. Um, and that's the tempering process. That happens at a lot lower temperature. So hardening happens, as I said, up around 800 degrees, depending on the recipe. Tempering happens much lower. It may be tempering again is it's relevant to what you're making. So a knife would be tempered to retain a lot of hardness. So you would temper it at 200 or 250 degrees Celsius. Whereas something like a, a mattock or a shovel or a spring would be tempered at four or 500 degrees Celsius because you're pulling a lot of the brittleness out. You are sacrificing hardness that you've gained, but you're increasing the toughness. And that's key for a, a struck tool or something like that. And this goes back to that thing I said at the start where you've really got to pick your recipe and then complementing that, you've really got to pick your heat treatment schedule because you can turn a really nice piece of steel into a piece of rubbish if you don't heat treat it properly. Um, so these two things need to be factored in and, and respected along the way. But that's what hardening and tempering basically mm. is. It's um, and, and your quenching medium is important too. So the, the speed at which you cool it gets dictated by what you cool it in. So you can quench some steels in water, whereas others, if you try and quench them in water, they will snap. Um, You can quench some steels in oil, but some steels you quench in oil and they won't attain enough hardness because they didn't cool fast enough. Mm. Some steels will just 
harden in, in just air. Mm. You pull them out of the forge, you put them on the bench and they will harden of, of their own accord because they've got a high alloy content and that's enough for them. Yeah. And some so, in sand as well. So you might have, when you when you see people doing sand, that's a different heat treat heat treatment thing. That's an annealing process. Okay. What that means is the exact opposite to what we just talked about. So when you cool something quickly, you introduce a lot of stress. When you cool it really slowly, you re- reduce the stress as much as possible. So let's say I wanted to machine a component. I've got an uh, an axle shaft, for example, or a landing gear component, something that's high stress, but I need to do some machining on it. I will do my forging, I'll get the rough shape laid out, and then I need to anneal it because if I just take that straight to the machine shop and put it on the mill, you'll throw carbide cutters like no one's business. So you've got to cool it down really, really slowly. That'll give you your best uh, machine ability. I guess that'll give you your best softest form of that steel. And then you take it back and you harden after the fact. So normalizing and annealing are these two processes that you're talking about with a really slow cool down that just allow you to de-stress the material, take as much hardness out as possible so that you can further kind of value add to the part. That was awesome. (laughs) <laughs> I, hope, I hope it wasn't too convoluted. It's really I, I nerd out a bit sometimes on because I love the science yeah. of, of material, science of, of metal, and uh, yeah. So Man, I really enjoyed that. We can talk about it all day. Brilliant. <laughs> that, 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 I mean, there's there's a lot of I was going to say a lot of moving parts, but there's just there's so much stuff that you wouldn't have even thought of. <laughs> so depending on what you want to make, you either you call it quickly or you call it slowly. What's um What's your favorite piece? Your favorite project that you worked on? Um. Oh, you've really put me on the spot because there's a lot of projects that I've loved working on. I've worked on with friends, yeah, and they've been different friends for different projects, yeah. Um, so I'm, you know, I don't want to pick friends. I don't want to pick favorite friends. <laughs> um, but all of my favorite projects have been a, around big group projects, um, and they've mostly been sculptural. So we've done a few really lovely public art pieces. Um, that I'd, I've just enjoyed the process so much. You know, it's it's lovely to have a, a something that's come out of your workshop out in the public domain that people can enjoy and and hope. Sorry, that people can hopefully enjoy. Yeah, <laughs> um, there's a lot of rubbish public art out there too, but I, I don't. I hope that people don't think that that's what we've produced. But where can um, where can we see your stuff? Where can um, so uh, a couple of the projects we've worked on lately. Um, We've had one installed. So we did a, a job with a, a great blacksmith and friend of mine called Roberto Giordani. He's an Italian master smith. Um, I met him over in Italy and did some work with him there and just, oh, we just we just bonded, you know. I was in Italy and he's a beautiful, he's a great chef and he's a great blacksmith and, you know, we were staying at his house, a friend of mine and I, and, you know, it was just one of those, we just got on, you know. Yeah. So I said to him, fuck, we've got to find a project and bring it out bring you out to Australia. So we did it. We set up this, um, we we ended up, it was a shark, um, but it was four metres tall, nearly a tonne and a half weight. Um, so it's a monster of a thing. It's this beautiful big great white shark that was that he designed mm. um, and sort of we'd back and forwarded for months on, you know, what the design was and how we were going to do it and we put a team together. I think we ended up having maybe eight or ten people mm-hmm. from around Australia come in for the build. Wow. And we went hell for leather. It was about two and a half weeks and we just, as I said, there was go- there was people from Northern Territory. We had a couple of guys from Queensland, a couple of guys from Victoria, and we just worked on this thing nonstop. You know, we'd start at seven in the morning, finish at six at night, and, you know, we got it done. We, we built this thing and now it's installed up in Port Macquarie up on the um, – they've got a boardwalk and it looks stunning installed because it's it, it's on this pier basically. So it looks like the shark's kind of levitating above the water and you can sort of look out onto the ocean and you can see it there in its natural environment and it's awesome. just stuff like that. Yeah, it's so cool. cool to work with. Um, you know, we've, we've done some, some other projects around Sydney. There's one just near the workshop which I can show you when you visit that I did with a – wonderful artist and great friend of mine, Nell. Um, that, that was about three months worth of build. So we built, it's called the, the Everly Treehouse. Um, and that was a really cool project in a different way. So, you know, Roberto's was very, very centered around blacksmithing and very like go, go, go kind of the, the job had to be built and it was only two weeks and he was flying back to Italy and there was just all these, you know, it was a big pressurized situation. Um, whereas the build with Nell was different in that, it was very community involved. So we, we set up workshops 
so we, they're these big like gum nut kind of pods, huge things. They're like, I think they're four or five meters tall. I remember we couldn't get them out of the shop in one piece. So I was suspended in this thing called a man cage, which is basically just, it's smaller than a fridge, by the way. It's like, you know, those shark cages yeah. they dive in. It's like that, except it gets suspended from a crane. And so I get in this thing with my welder and I'm standing on top of the welding machine because there's not enough footprint for me yeah. to stand next to the thing. I was a little bit hung over the day that we did the welding. Um, so they've, they've got me suspended like 10 metres up in the air, welding in this man cage that's swinging around in the breeze. I'm not bad with heights, but I was a bit confronted. And, you know, I'm trying to hold the top of this sculpture together while I'm doing the welding. It was uh, – look, it came off beautifully, but it was terrifying. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, so the, these big gum nut shaped um, kind of pods that you can walk up inside of and – sit inside and have some lunch and it's they're elevated off the ground quite a ways and um but they've all got these individually forged leaves so all the way around the pod we've got these gum leaves that are fairly well life-sized and they were forged by the community i think we did oh god i can't remember but it was about 20 or 25 sessions and each session had about 15 to 20 people in it and people would come in and make a dozen or so leaves over the course of two hours would have a feed and have a yarn have a good time and people were stamping their, their names into the leaves. Not everyone, but they'd stamp their names in as a, as a reminder. And those leaves all then got integrated into the sculpture. So it's one of those true community builds. Yeah, and it was awesome. so cool to have. Mm. And most of the people that worked on it just had no – they'd have no connection to blacksmithing in, in any other capacity, you know. It was just really foreign for a lot of people, which was magic to be able to introduce them to something like that. Yeah. Um, so how, on some of those big projects, like how do you go with the collaboration when you've got, <clears throat> you know, that you, said, you said earlier on that you've got a person with the design, the view, the vision, mm. what they want it to be like. You're then bringing in people from different parts of the world that have, might have different experiences, different time in industry. How, who leads, I guess, the, the projects and who has final say and who says that's rubbish and that's not? And it, it's really case by case, but and it's really situational. Like, so in any design process, I'm I'm very respectful of the fact that when we're building with an artist, that it's their that's their passion project. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the same as when I take a commission. Mm -hmm. You know, and and it's the same in reverse. When I'm building something for myself, I'm the boss. When I'm building something with somebody else. We need to set up boundaries where I can be able to say what I think and they can say what they think and we don't take it personally. And we need to set up a situation where – because most people don't understand what is capable in, in the art of blacksmithing. You know, if, if you came to me and said, oh, I want to build a, I want to build a bed frame, you might have a preconceived idea of how you want to put that together, but in my mind, I'm like, well, there's a shitload of easier way to approach that that mm. you wouldn't know because you're not part of part of that trade. Yeah. Um, so you know, there is a big to and fro in a collaboration like that where somebody will they'll come with a vision, and it's the same with every commission. Someone comes with a vision, and then it's my job to kind of look at it, dissect it, figure out if the way that the components are currently arranged or designed makes sense for the project and makes sense for our process in the project. And then we have a conversation about what can be compromised and what can't. And in a lot of cases, like compromise is a dirty word, but in a lot of cases, it's not an aesthetic compromise. It's just the practicality of getting from A to B and, you know, how would a blacksmith approach something compared to how a fabricator would approach something. Um, so I have a lot of those conversations and I don't feel weird about it at all. Like it's, I've made some of my best friends doing these sorts of collaborations because even though they're big and they're stressful and there's big money involved, you know, like big financial risk involved, I guess, in doing these sorts of things, at the end of the day, everybody has the same goal and that's to create something wonderful. Mm. So it's easy to find that common ground and then it's just riffing on how do we make that dream, you know, how does, how, how does it manifest in the real world? Um, my, one of a dear friend of mine now, I'd never met him six months ago, but, um, there's quite a, quite a famous artist, um, uncle Badger Bates, who's a, a Barkaji man. He does a lot of water rights advocacy, spends a lot of time chasing water around the Murray Darling, particularly the Darling that's, that flows through the land that he grew up on. Um, but he was approached recently to build a set of gates. Um, 
And he said to me, and it's one of the most lovely things I've ever heard and I'll, it'll stick with me forever. But he, I don't know how old uncle is. He'd be in his mid seventies probably. I have asked him, but I've forgotten. But, it, you know, he's in his mid-70s and he spent his whole life out in the outback in the bush and, uh, you know, he spent a lot of his time chasing water rights and, and um, just, just trying to get a fair go for the river systems that are really struggling out there. And he was like, but, Matt, that wasn't, not, that wasn't my plan. I always wanted to be a blacksmith. And now at 76 years of age, I can be the guy that gets to teach this fella how to be a blacksmith. Mm-hmm. And that is so – that's so special for me because I know every time he's in the shop, he he flies all the way. He lives in Broken Hill now, but he flies to Sydney every maybe once a month, maybe every six weeks to check on the progress. We've been working on these gates since January. But he'll give us a, a bit of a spiel and he'll very, you know, he'll roughly kind of draw pictures and draw statements on the ground of how he wants the thing to progress. And then, you know, it's my job to just, interpret and translate and put bits together and then he'll come back weeks later and he'll go yeah nah we'll do some changes we'll do whatever we got to do um and then you know we'll work together on the next components for these gates and they're monsters like they're i think they're four and a half meters tall and there's uh, there's there's three gates in total and each gate's three meters wide so there's a lot of real estate to fill up with art you know um and they're but they're very they're, they're not – they're quite a contemporary set of gates. You know, they're not your traditional scrolls and forms and it's mm. like very much telling a story and he's telling some of his creation stories from, you know, from his his family and from his his people out there. So it's such a intimate job and it's you know, a really mm. special connection and just, just to be part of doing stuff like that, that is super, super, super. Mm. Um, I, I don't know how I ever got to be here but to do stuff like that and to be involved in such – immense projects with guys that are, um, you know, f- for in Badger's case, you know, he j- he's wanted to work in metal his whole life. And now he's coming to me and being like, hey, Matt, do you reckon you could make me a forge? Do you reckon you could make me a gas forge so I can do a bit of this at home? You know, can you make me a hammer? I, I don't, you know, you can buy a hammer at Bunnings, but he wants, he wants one of my hammers because mm. that means something to him yeah. to swing a hammer that I made. And yeah. I have hammers that people that I really respect have made for me and I swing them because it's that, that kind of continual that 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 transfer of knowledge and that yeah. uh, the, the appreciation that someone's put sweat into something. Yeah. So and and keeping a scene alive though. I mean, as you said, anyone can go down to <clears throat> excuse me, Bunnings and buy a hammer. Yep. But if you've got a story behind it um, and a personal connection, I mean, that's it becomes an heirloom piece. Exactly. Yeah. Yep. Exactly right. And you know, you'd never mistake a handmade hammer for better or for worse. You know, you you're never going to see a handmade hammer in someone's workshop and go, oh, that's a Bunnings hammer. Mm-hmm. So you, it always starts a story. It always starts a conversation. Um, and I, I very much hope, you know, we've we've done a lot of hammer making classes, for example, and I know that, you know, they're all out in the world somewhere. One of the <laughs> – this is maybe a little bit narcissistic, but one of the lovely things about teaching classes is it doesn't matter. So we, we've had maybe 3,000 students, I reckon, in the last five years who have come in and made various things. Um, and it doesn't matter where the product of those classes has ended up. They always came out of Everly. Mm. They're, they're Everly hammers at the end of the day. And it's really cool to know that I've got pieces that I've had a hand in spread all the way across, not just Australia, they're all around the world. And they, they all came out of that same shop. They all came out of the same fires. Um, I just, I see it as like this little network of energy that's, been spread around the world and it's, you know, every time someone looks at a job like that and appreciates where it came from, it, it kind of it enriches that story. Mm-hmm. I, I really love that. Well, I, I think that's a great way to conclude this, the podcast, mate. That's that's one hell of a message. Oh, it's lovely right. to have a yarn. Well, well, I'm going to ask my last question as well. So I've already put you on the spot once. <laughs> sure. So you've got a table booked for four people. You're one of them. So you can have three guests at dinner. Mm. Who would they be and why? Oh wowza! Um, I uh, I think I'd I, alive. I really Stephen Fry. I just love the dude. Yeah, <laughs> he's just so bright and he's fun and so knowledgeable. I, I really appreciate those guys. That he just seems to have limitless capacity for mm. stupid information, mm. and I love that. Pub ammo. Oh, <laughs> totally, man. 
Like I reckon he, I'm sure he's in just about everyone's top five. I'd like <laughs> he's just one of those guys. Um, so he'd definitely be on the list. Um, I think there's a few really, really important scientists I'd love to have a yarn with just because I'd love, I love processes. Like I love, it comes through with blacksmithing as well, but I love watching other people work because they approach things different to the way I would. And like, I, I think the way that scientists look at the world and they break it down and they kind of distill, they try and cut through the bullshit and figure out the, the most reductive way or the, the most clear and concise way to get to something. I think he was a real dick, but I'd love to have a yarn with Isaac Newton. I just, you know, he's, he's, he's a famous dick, yeah. but he's also the father of calculus yeah. and he's, you know, he within his lifetime and he wasn't even that prolific, sorry, like he, he didn't have a huge long life. He was really prolific in a short period of time, um, but he just worked on everything, so, like someone like Da Vinci as well, mm. you know. I'm going to swap from Newton to Da Vinci, in fact. <laughs> Because he just knew he, busy he, anyway. Knew no I, he said he just messaged me. He can't make it because he's a dick. He's not. He's not busy. He just doesn't want to come. Typical Newton. <laughs> um, so Da Vinci, Stephen Fry. Yeah, Da Vinci's definitely coming. Um, and this one's a bit sappy, but uh, you know, the opportunity to have have a good have a good beer, have a meal with my dad would yeah. be. You know, I lost him maybe ten years ago, yeah. and like that would be a really special thing to just. Just tell more stories. Yeah, Just yeah. be where I am now and tell more stories. You know, we were all of my my generation, you know, all of I'm the eldest of five. Yeah. We were all just kids and you know, to to not get to know your dad as an adult, mm. I think I see my friends that are now friends with their parents. Mm. Yeah. And, you know, I I'd I'd love to be able to have that opportunity. Yeah. So that's that's probably the third dude. Sounds perfect, mate. Sounds yeah. perfect. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> well, look, thank you very much for coming on and taking the time to share your story, your passion, your vision. Um, it's incredible and I can't wait to come and make something and just yes. get my hands dirty. Um, you do have, you know, soap there that I can – I won't leave dirty, will I? I have some of the best <laughs> soap you can buy. Awesome. That's awesome. <laughs> really? Not a plug. I'm not sponsored. <laughs> Worths make the best hand soap. It's Worth. The, worth. Yeah. So I think the Germans pronounce it w- Earths. But, yeah, yeah, it's the automotive brand. Yeah. Gritted the grit, the fine grit cleaner, the hand cleaner. They they sell it in a five liter tub. That will pull anything off anything. No, nah, there's better. Raynol, Raynol's oh. way better than that. I'll bring some. You reckon? Yeah, mate, mate oh. game changing. Wow. All right, well, that's <laughs> a big call because I haven't used Raynol. <laughs> yeah, it's fantastic. <laughs> Next time you say I'm going to bring a bowl, I'm going to say don't bother. <laughs> um, so how can people get a hold of you? Um, look, I'm notoriously elusive on the phone, as yeah. people like to tell me, but. Um, We've we've got a website yeah. www.everly.works. Yeah. Um, jump on there; it's got all the details. You know, we don't um, we kind of don't solicit business. So if you've got a, a commission or whatever you want to have a yarn about, just get in touch with me. Mm. I'm the guy at the end of the phone when I when I pick up. Mm. Um, so yeah, jump on the web; all my details are there. Awesome. Yeah, or Thanks. follow us on Instagram. That's the vi- I'm a visual storyteller. Get on Instagram first because then you see all the shit that we're doing. You're on the gram, yeah, I love Instagram. Awesome. I hate <laughs> Facebook. Love Instagram. Yeah, Instagram's good. Yeah. Thank you very much for coming on. No, thanks for having me. Awesome.